So let's go back then to let's, this is actually kind of the main focus of it as we start this anyway. But the thing is to keep in mind that mobility is not just about physical movement. Um, it encompasses the ability to engage fully in community life. And, and that's the thing that sometimes I think uh, we forget or we don't look broad enough. So um, also to look at maintaining cultural practices and really enjoying a high quality of life. Um, so there's a lot more to just being able to get up, go to the bathroom, you know, kind of those ADLs um, that really make a difference here. So if I took and put this across um, these areas and we look at mobility plus healthcare plus well-being. So the first is just the cultural and spiritual connection. I mean, really, uh, I look at a lot of the elders nowadays and a lot of them just looking at the mobility to to still be able to engage in cultural practices and ceremonies. There's a huge piece of connection to the land and ancestors. And this is something that even within myself, not yet quite getting to um, being elderly, but I'm moving toward that direction is um, really understanding that connection to the land much more so and being able to just be out there, you know, in nature. Social participation then is the second one. When we remove that mobility within our community um, and our interactions with others, it really plays a vital role in um, isolation and affecting mental health and wellness. So when we have those social interactions available through that mobility, then our elders play a vital role in being able to pass down traditional language, stories, and values. And one of the things that I always remember um, from my grandparents and even one, even from my great grandfather that I remember is just the stories they would tell. And sometimes you don't think those stories have any connection to anything, but in reality, they are sharing some uh, kind of pearls of pearls of life, right? Access to healthcare services is another one. It affects our ability to move freely and to go and seek out medical care. So a lot of times we're kind of stuck with whatever someone can bring to us. And um, I think bringing, bringing healthcare or the access to healthcare to, to the individuals is important, but I think we don't look at how we need to provide that in a more broad, broad sense within our communities. Physical health, we know that already. That's the primary thing that we're looking at. Um, when we consider mobility is just, you know, different activities that the person can engage in. And then that helps, uh, you know, really deal with um, the chronic conditions and making it so the person actually actually can restrain, uh, retain their strength, um, mental health and wellness, as well as physical. Going into mental and emotional well-being then is when we're able to move around, engage with others, um, this results in feelings of isolation and depression. Um, and, and these really hit home with me because I'm going to share a little bit further three stories of, of three very important women in my life, um, looking at some of the challenges that they they have when we look at um, limited mobility. Then the last part then is just a holistic approach. Indigenous wellness is holistic. Um, and I think healthcare is slowly moving that direction and considering this, but it's still not quite there. But if we look at the whole person as a whole, we have to look at the mind, body, and spirit. And so um, when you don't have significant balance in one area, it throws off all the rest. And you're not ever going to have perfect balance. But how do we bring those so they're, they're at least more balanced and that person can actually engage um, in the life that they're trying to live with their family and community? So this comes out of... Um, as they, there was a scoping review and the title of it is Aging Well uh, for Indigenous Peoples. And so the um, I did include this in, in the um, references. But what, what this uh, scoping review found that there's three areas when we look at aging well and one is achieving holistic health and well-being. These are some of the things I just touched on um, as well as maintaining connections with our own identity, family, and community, which is so essential to having a balance of uh, mental health and wellness, right? Um, and it allows us to to connect with um, the other quadrants that are on here. But also uh, aging well reveals resilience, humor, and a positive attitude. So those things, when they're in place, also help give our elders a better quality of life. And that contribution to what um, we have to our youth, to our community from those elders is really essential. And I think sometimes that's been lost kind of in in the woods. But circle there then are the, the challenges that our elders are facing and our communities are facing in helping them 
being able to engage in that quality of life through mobility. So we're looking at some of those challenges, and I'll touch on those a little bit more, some of them, but access to services, culturally safe health programs and services, um, access to resources. We're looking at the impact when we talk about um, just the prior presentation by Dr. Lajmadir, looking at that grief and loss, historical trauma, loss of language traditions and culture. And when we're looking at our elders currently today, we are looking at elders who did, um, you know, with, I know within the 70s, in the age range of 70s, 80s, 90s, were um, still within those boarding schools. And in fact, I'm not in my 70s, you know, but um, I went to boarding school and my mom would have turned 82, 83 this year. Um, and the impact of that um, is significant when I look at even in my own my own family background. So kind of that just tips right into how we look at understanding the barriers and constraints, but also the facilitators and the facilitators are the motivators to physical movement among indigenous elders. And so some of the uni unique challenges basically is um, summarized here, but it was also in the prior slide, but looking at limited access to healthcare and resources. We look at the distance, you know, being in remote or rural areas, um, socioeconomic factors, we're looking at poverty. I know some of the elders that I know right now, based on because of the difficulty um, due to being so rural, finding jobs that actually paid well when they were younger, being able to, especially women, Indigenous women, elders, you know, some of them are getting $900 from Social Security, which really, if you look at how are you going to live on that, is um, pretty, pretty limited. You have to depend a lot on your community and your family. And those that don't have that, you know, are really, um, really struggling. So then we see limited access to nutritious food, which affects our physical health. And then environmental factors. And so we have the interconnected health issues that they can, um, that they face with a higher prevalence of chronic health conditions. And, you know, you look at, um, my mom um, was diabetic, and you look at how it's sadly too common within reservations, but Sometimes you could hear people talk about, oh, she's diabetic. And it almost sounds like, oh, she has a cold. You know, so so changing that that um, perception, too, of these chronic health conditions, that there is a way to prevent, you know, if we look at early, early care, um, early access, early prevention processes, but then also that there is a process that we can keep our elders healthier um, if we keep more engaged with them, both in the community and healthcare settings. So if we look at some of those factors impacting engagement, we know the barriers or constraints already are going to be physical health, depending if there is a chronic condition or anything that occurred um, physically. Um, I look at, I'm going to share a story about my aunt a little bit, but she had fallen and broke her wrist. And so um, then there was another, within two weeks, she had fallen and broken the other wrist. So then all of a sudden her physical health, that was a major barrier. It's not that she didn't, um, have the ability to to move or, you know, was not mobile in her environment, but this definitely impacted that. Mental health is a huge one, especially when we look at um, isolation. Um, unmotivated, often just because of what's occurring physically and mentally, or sometimes too busy. Um, I know elders that are taking care of their grandkids, you know, so it just depends on that too, and trying to contribute to the family. Um, and then facilitators, though, within that is if they were active in the, in the past, then they're probably still active now or they're interested in, in maintaining that level of activity. Enjoyment, physical health, mental health, and personal connection to the land. These are things that we can build on that has come out of various articles that, especially this one by Peterson and all in 2021, but how we can use those motivators to actually um, facilitate that active engagement and mobility. Mental health factors. Uh, these are all interconnected, of course, because uh, you can't separate a person out in quadrants, right? But we look at um, decreased motivation due to chronic existing conditions. And sometimes there's just a feeling of hopelessness, you know, um, especially too, if they're living alone or uh, minimal interaction with others or um, access to health care. There's a fear of worsening health um, due to injuries that may be associated with physical activity. So there's a fear of falling or overexertion, you know, because if they do fall, then who's going to be there? So then they really start limiting themselves to what they will do 
um, just to kind of as a preventive factor, but at um, but actually it ends up putting them more at risk. And then we look at the facilitators with that. If we wanted to really pull that in more, we can look at retaining independence. You know, so how do we um, how do we look at that fall prevention and teaching them about safe mobility and um, engagement into the ADLs or IADLs that they need to do on a daily basis without having that fear or trying to reduce the um, the fear of, of moving at all. And so um, the concept of balance is raised by some, you know, we look at if you have that balance again, then we can pull that in as a motivator or, you know, they understand the, the balance um, approach. Social factors, we look at sometimes there's no walking partners. And again, just that fear of being alone. If something happens, you know, what well, um, nobody's there to, to kind of help them out. Um, physical inactivity is a social norm, sometimes within communities or within a family. Um, family community responsibilities, I talked a little bit in the last slide about still raising grandchildren. And I do know that a great uncle of mine, um, he's raising great grandchildren. And he's he's in his... Uh, late 80s. Um, in fact, he and his wife are going to be celebrating their 60, 66th wedding anniversary, but they're raising kids. And then decreased support for elders in the community. Um, I'm going to hit on that a little bit later, but sometimes we talk about how the, we value our elders. We need to start putting basically our money um, where our mouth is, and we need to really put some things in place to really show that because our elders are um, vital to our um you know, to a healthy cultural um, system that we need for our youth and for um, actually all the age ranges. Motivators then, um, we're going to use some of these to help them hopefully, and some of these they probably already have is the reasons that they want to engage, but the opportunities are so limited. And then again, it goes to environmental, especially if you um, live up here. So I live, I'm from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Reservation. So I do live up here. And like I said, I work remote um, for UND, but we look at the cold or the winter, you know, and even, even in some places that maybe don't get as cold, but you have um, kind of that, a lot of, a lot of this winter we had ice, you know, so um, that's preventative. And then we look at um, lack of acceptable walking areas because um, that's all connected to safety, et cetera. Some of these motivators we're going to talk about later when I look at what the community, community, um, and IHS and other tribal leaders should be doing, uh, could be doing to assist our elders. Social determinant factors impacting engagement, um, touch base, but this is a nice kind of um, slide to summarize that. And then there's this, um, the care gap for Indigenous seniors. Um, I do have the, the link down there, but we look at aging in place and long-term care on Native American reservations. This came out of the United South and Eastern tribes. And the, um, like I said, the, the link is down there. But um, American Indian and um, Alaska Native continue to be the most understudied and underserved in terms of health care and elderly care. And that population, our population of elders is projected to double in the number of elders who will soon need long-term care or need some, some type of a, assistance. And that's where we're really struggling. Um, so sometimes by the time we, we could, um, or sometimes by the time they seek help, then we're looking at long-term care um, because they have more, more physical needs even by then. Lack of an outreach um, compounds the issue. Um, I'm going to touch base on this in a little bit. And then limited health literacy contributes to many eligible elders not applying for Medicaid expansion because they don't know that they should. And this happened actually to my aunt. And so she never applied for it. And so when it came time for her to look at long-term care, she um, didn't have that that part of um, a service that could have benefited her. Mm -hmm. Many reservations lack nursing homes because of the combination of the Medicaid certification process and often viewed culturally as a place to go to die. And I know that was often the view here as well. Um, but you have the red tape that makes it so difficult to be able to, when you're working with the, the tribal governments, the federal government, state governments, et cetera. And so that really throws um, some of the services that our elders could be accessing out of whack and then of course the best approach is to um, provide services um, outreach that can help them age in place that shows the best for mental health as well as physical health 
So I'm going to share some um, innovative approaches that are out there. Some of these <laughs> might seem um, not as an option, depending on the elders that you might know within your own family. Um, but some of them are, um, are, you know, pretty, pretty solid in what they could provide, depending on who was there to, to assist them. And then we're going to look at um, some collaborative strategies. So the first one always is safety, right? And that's, that's our main priority when we look at safety. So um, I don't know if, if you, you probably are aware of this, but there are resources out there, like such as what AARP has out, um, is this home fit? And so it just walks you through some of the boxes that you can go and check to see, um, is there task lighting? You know, so is there at least one step um, free entrance into the home, et cetera? Does the bathroom have, you know, what type of um, faucet? And so it just kind of gets you thinking about what would improve or um, assist the elder into transitioning, you know, um, as their skills, skill level changes, but keeping the home um, safe. Then in the next one, you look at um, these are to-do lists. So if you see something that maybe isn't connecting in the first one, then um, you could look at what are some ideas over here. So remove scatter rugs or throw rugs. That's huge. Really remove clutter. Um, sometimes, you know, even looking at um, this might be hard for some elders, but sometimes when you have cats or pets too, they tend to go right around your feet always, especially when they're looking at food. So maybe there's a part where they can um, kennel them for a bit, you know, as they move through the house and then unkennel them when they're they're going to sit um, and just kind of relax. So anyway, these resources are free. You can download them. And there is um, much more. Sorry, this is kind of um, really difficult to see in a way, but it just goes then to a supply list, a do-it-yourself list. And if you need to bring in a contractor, some of the things that you could act, ask the contractor. So. Um, there's the link um, that you will you will get for that. So there's three areas in in the strategies are you know processes are um, activities that I'm going to present. We're going to look at one. Um, a lot of these fit into home based, and we have a well balanced balanced program that's very well known. I'll touch on that. But then we're going to look at some online app programs and virtual reality and <laughs> gaming, and then a power of sweat. Um, online program that's available as well. And I think, again, I'm thinking sometimes with some of the elders that are in my family, hmm, VR might not work for them, but there are other ways that we can use online programming for them. And then community-based, and any of these can actually be community-based. It would be awesome if they were actually done in a group, um, bringing people together, and then, um, then you add that social piece as well. So we do have these ones that you can access, you can find online. Um, sometimes you'll get handouts from the IHS or from other um, healthcare providers. And that just gives you some ideas of what's safe exercise. You might get this from your physical therapist or your occupational therapist, how you can um, do these um, tips to prevent falls. What are some of the things that can strengthen the muscles so um, you don't you decrease that risk, you know, or some of the ways that you can set up your house. What are some mobility um, assistive devices, et cetera. Um, and these are some other, other variety of, um, different handouts that some, um, again, organizations or healthcare providers could, could provide, but you could also get these online, you know, and you want to look at the, the difficulty that I have with these sometimes when I worked with elders is sometimes you can look at these pictures, but it's still hard to see with some of them. What exactly do you mean? You know, um, and you think about sometimes where the vision is for some of our elders, and there's a lot on some of these um, pages as far as the why and the how. How can you break those up so it's easier to see? And then how do you make this so it ain't so cumbersome so they don't have 10 pages of exercises that they're trying to do? And I, I've seen that where, you know, we give a, a home program to elders and the pictures are bad. They've been probably copied, I don't know how many times, but there's also so many. And then in reality, it's it can be boring right? I mean, you're going to do these activities, um, but to, and it comes to a point where what is the motivation? Um, because you're kind of doing things that you're not quite seeing what their impact would be. And the first one, we look at strength exercises, aerobic. It's kind of nice when they have the how, you know, how you can still get this. It doesn't always have to be lifting weights, but you could get it through walking, gardening, dancing, you know, yoga, et cetera. So giving them some variety too um, really helps with motivation and 
uh, sustainability. Again, here's just a couple different examples. Um, so when you're choosing something, look for something that is not so busy on one page, but also clear um, for them to um, to use, you know, so they can see exactly um, what to do as far as what the movement is required, but then also the purpose of it. I mean, I need to do this, why? You know, and it'd be nice if you had like the, the one here where it says, um, Oh, let me go. Tips for to prevent falls for seniors. Well, then they know why and they know how some of these can help them, you know, with their balance, et cetera. And so this is the Well Balance Program, um, actually, that came out of it's connected to the National Resource Center on Native American Aging. Um, and so it, it was uh, UND had a huge piece in the development of this. And it's a group program designed specifically for Native American elders. And you can go on. Um, the hub and you can order this um, or you can look at this this program and I know they sent me information on it and then they followed up with saying can we help you do you want some um, training on this program etc you know so I think um, this is a really good one if you're going to look at kind of where to start you know at a, at a group-based program then we're going to look at these are coming out more and more rehabs are using these when we look at video games and believe it or not, um, you can still buy Wii's. <laughs> you buy them um, reconditioned, but there is a lot in there with Wii Sports. Um, these are some of just the examples of things that you can you can get. There's some that are um, you would pay you know money for for that app, but there's some that are free. Um, I'm going to show you show you some examples. So this one is just a nice um, basic one. That is, um, this is an occupational therapist who works in a nursing home, but this is also could be something that you do for group and taking um, basic things that you can have anywhere and um, actually using them. I forgot to say that he is in um, Norway, but what I like about um, his activities is that you can even do these, you know, if you set up that small um, cornhole, if you had one made, they could do it with their grandchildren right at home. Or, you know, you can look, look at outside and putting a regular one up in um, different activities that they could just do. Or you think about a lot of times we want to have that intergenerational, um, those activities or opportunities. So what are some of these things that they could do with, with um, great grandchildren or grandchildren, you know, just just seem like play, but they're actually engaged in movement. And then that movement, of course, you know, and just that um, social interaction um, really becomes a, a major um, factor for them. Huh. So yeah, these are some more examples when we look at um, online and app exercise programs. Um, we do have a variety of different choices, which I think is kind of cool. And so if something doesn't fit for them, then you can just you know, try something else. And there is a chair yoga one. And I did um, put a link there. So you can check on that if you want, but you choose according to age and it does go by like 60 to 65, 65, to, you know, kind of like that. And that's $8 a month. And then you choose the exercises within that. And that's the first one. Um, but I didn't realize how many there were out there either. You know, so I was pretty impressed by, by the um, options or the choices that there are. Um, so now Nancy, you're going to have to forward for me, huh? Yeah, but that's okay. Okay. So this is the Paula Sweat program. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this at all, but it comes out of Coeur d'Alene in, um, Idaho. And it was actually pretty cool. Um, if we could just show a bit of that anyway. 
This is very cool. Maybe the sound doesn't want to work, huh? Sound coming How through. else what is the aerobic exercise there it goes. done to Native American music? How else what uses different kinds of power dances? We have men's traditional, women's traditional, men's grass, men's chicken, men's fancy feather, women's jingle, women's traditional, women's old style fancy, and we also have a women's pro hop. How else what is a serious workout video? However, we bring little bits of comic relief to lighten the mood. Drop the pants and let's jingle. <laughs> Up front. Also to show people that it's okay to not have a six pack. It's okay to not be ripped. As long as you're making those little steps to increase physical activity, that's all we need. By increasing physical activity, we can become healthy. You can do it at home in the comforts of your own home. You know, you don't have to be at a gym feeling awkward about your body style or body type. So this program you can get um, off YouTube and they have a variety of different, um, uh, like she said, she gave all the, the different examples that you could, different types of dances. On the next um, slide then, this was an interesting one when we look at elderly gamers. <laughs> like I said, until, so when I was putting this together, I asked to put this together, I was thinking, okay, we need, what else is out there? And so I got connected with um, this topic, but I didn't realize the extent either. So virtual reality games offer, like I said, a dynamic interactive solution when we look at maintaining active lifestyle for older adults. And I didn't realize that an estimated 15% of people play video games are over the age of 55, which I don't know why that surprised me because gamers age, right? And these games all started back in the 80s for many, so it would make sense. But some of the research that has been done um, found that uh, the benefits are better emotional well-being. There's a social interaction piece there, which really helps with isolation. Um, and then extra games are enhanced cognitive ability. So it looks like this video had trouble. Um, is this the one, Nancy, that had difficulty? Yeah. Okay, so the link is in the, when you get the slides, the link is there. And it's it's really cool just to look at how, um, and like I said, this is common, what they started using in rehabs too. but. Um, uh, it's pretty cool what the what the types of different movement is stimulated and then kind of the fun part, right? Um, exercise, just like education, shouldn't be that painful, I don't think. And the less painful it is, um, I think, then the more people engage without even realizing that they're exercising because they're moving. And, and that's the key. Um, so on the next slide, um, we look at some of the pros. And so I talked about the social interaction, enhanced mental health. Um, research is also showing the stimulant cognitive abilities. And I know when I tried one of these VRs on my mom, and this was back in 2014, 15, um, she was so, and she was in her seventies then she, um, thought it was just so cool because, um, actually the VR was sitting in, um, Paris, prior to one of the, um, one of the areas in Paris and she was just going through and touching everything. And she was just in awe of it. You know, so it's not it's not only for for movement in that way, but even just to show other places that are out there. There's so much things that could really open up um, to what their experiences can be supported by. And then there's a wide variety, you know, so that's the other part. But on the next slide, it does look at the cons of VR. And so when I was talking to um, uh, one of my nieces about this and she's a nurse and she was like, well, wait a minute, she said, there's some motion sickness that goes in there. And so when we look at the cons, um, it can be expensive, especially when we look at high quality systems. Um, it can be complex, you know, so you'd really want to have some good training there um, to help them or really within a group too. And then 
And then she was exactly right. We look at motion sickness and for some individuals, especially if the virtual environment is too fast or disorienting. So you're going to want to maybe start them out with something that um, is not um, as fast or maybe it's just not for them, you know, and, and that's part of when we look at motion sickness too, that, you know, you'd work with the healthcare provider and see if there's any concerns there. And then we look at physical limitations. It might not be suitable for some, depending on um, their physical limitations, how severe or dis dis uh, disabled they are. But I, I still think when we look at some of the ability to just go and experience things cognitively, I think there's a huge benefit there. And then isolation, while it can provide social interaction, it can also contribute to isolation. Um, if maybe they become too dependent um, on, on that vis uh, virtual interaction. So still, you still want to get people out into the, um, into the community as much as possible because um, that, that connection is essential. We look at everyday tasks, and of course, this is my OT side, right? And so um, there was one of the other slides that talked about how we can bring these things in, and a lot of times you don't even realize that you're, you're exercising, but you're just moving, and even that movement um, works on that balance and strength and um, mobility range of motion, et cetera. So those are some of the, just the general um, ways you can look at it and then we can progress. So here's the last part. Um, opportunities exist for healthcare providers, community leaders, and policymakers. And we have to get those three more active to develop strength-based culturally safe programs for um, one of our cultural treasures, right? We talk about indigenous elders being so important to our culture and they are, but again, then what are we doing to support that and give them a higher quality of life? So um, it takes a village to age optimally. And this comes out of uh, McMaster University. And I thought it was a pretty good, um, pretty good research um, when they looked at intergenerational programs. And so it is supported by research evidence and it's really strong, um, strongly supported by um, within indigenous communities because of that intergenerational piece and so this systematic review found that it improves the well-being of elders, helps reduce stigma associated with aging. So a lot of times we don't have, like, I know um, we don't have as much connection with our kids sometimes with the elders that we used to have in our community. And so it reconnects that and how we learn and um, we have elders who will teach and work with us and our kids. And then it helps improve a student's academic, behavioral, social, emotional, and motivational outcomes. So this is really a good um, research piece just to, to read up on. And again, it is in the references for you. Um, so building on that in the next slide then. Um, whoops. The other way. <laughs> Thank you for doing this for me, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we look at the contributions of elders. And so when we can have that intergenerational piece, we have that sharing of traditional knowledge and teaching indigenous, indigenous languages. And if you if you happen to have the opportunity to be in the first presentation um, by Dr. Lashmadir, you can see how that is really a healing process for communities um, and for individuals within that community. Um, and I know that um, our next two presenters, um, Dr. Trottier and Dr. Ness will also be building on those on those factors. But it does um, assist in all these areas and how we can use that intergenerational connection to really rebuild um, families, families and communities. And when you start with the individual and the family and then the community, you can see that positive um, outgrowth. So these are benefits of intergenerational programs. And so we do look at toddlers and children and this article and several other articles that are in the references bring this out. But really looking at that social emotional development, um, language and communication, cultural identity. Cultural identity is huge um, when we look at um, indigenous mental health and well-being. And um, it's strongly connected to some of the um, factors that are not so healthy within our culture. And this is, I can connect with this just personally, is the struggle when I was younger to really um, have a positive, solid cultural identity. Um, and so it did impact my early years of, of development. And it wasn't until I got older and started um, learning more that I actually were able to make those connections. But you can see then how the benefits for teenagers, young adults, elders, and then just across the board, um, I think the benefits outweigh some of the um, naysayers that could come, you know, to, to really um, maybe be um, finding reasons not to. These are the reasons to. 
bring this type of, of programming to our communities. So um, this is me, not really, but it was a good picture of me. Um, this was hard for me to put together because, um, like I said, I had done presentations before on mobility and just coming it coming to it with the lens of an occupational therapist, which is really clinical based. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, realizing that I'm I'm getting to that, you know, I'm going to be moving into that. Um, where I'm going to be coming the elder, but also just looking at what my, I'm going to share with you three, three people who are very important in my life, what some of their challenges were and why we're not addressing it. Um, and so some of the reasons, again, why it was so difficult for me was that we really need to look at more support. We can give home programs to our elders, but we're not providing the support that they need in order to engage in them successfully. And then a lot of times I know from a clinical perspective, then we'll write that they're non-compliant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're the ones not compliant. And I think that's where we're missing the boat is that if we want them to be successful, then we need to start providing those um, supports and resources that help them do that. So on, on the next slide, um, I talk about my mom. My mom was dealt with cancer. She was on dialysis. And so she had considerable limited strength and she lived with me until she passed away in the midst of that then she was dealing with um i was dealing with my brother's um health who eventually passed away and then i um got the blessing of having um his his children come and live with me so i had my mom the death of my brother and then two nieces and a nephew and my niece my youngest one was 14 uh, 14 months and i'm um, the oldest was 12 so you look at a family when we can send it and i my background is therapy. We can send these programs home and we're thinking, oh, she can help do them with her mom. And I did try. I eventually um, I eventually hired someone to come in and, and um, help my mom um, with her exercise program because I had all these other demands that were happening. Um, and so I was not able to kind of spread that out. And I'm looking at, like I said, I have a great uncle who is raising him and his, uh, my great aunt are raising their um, great grandchildren where do, where do they find the time or how do they balance, you know, kind of work through that in order to meet their own physical needs sometimes, which I know is put on the back burner, you know, so um, we're, we're not, we're not providing the kind of the assistance that we need at a variety of different levels for what these elders are really dealing with. Then uh, my next is my aunt and she lived alone intermittently. The challenge there was if, um, if she thought someone was homeless, she would let tell them, tell them to come and live with her. Um, and <laughs> that that resulted in her being taken advantage of at times. And it didn't matter if the family, you know, family member would usually go over there and kick that person out or those people out because sometimes there was huge families that would move in. And then my aunt was on a very limited financial budget, but she would go and buy this food or try and find this food to feed everybody. So her, her challenge... <laughs> or her strength was that she was such so giving and a big heart, like in, you know, in, in indigenous way. But then that's really what put her at not being in a safe environment and making safe decisions, um, which resulted in, you know, unsafe living conditions at times, because some of the people that were coming in there should never have been there. And then my other aunt, um, she had a lack of a structured exercise program. Um, so they, you know, they would tell her, well, you need to exercise she had no clue. So, I mean, I would go over there and, and help her, but that doesn't mean that the memory stays, right? If you can't have someone helping you um, do that at least once or twice a day. And she would purchase like, you know, the small, um, just like bike, you know, fo uh, foot bikes, um, you know, and just different things um, to try and keep her health up. But it's a challenge when you're by yourself. Um, and then even when you have family members who come in and try to help you, just remembering that that structure is really hard. And then there was times when we look at um, mental health um, and just physical safety of our of our elders who are living alone. Um, that's really a huge issue as well because no one is consistently coming coming in, you know, or there isn't that um, someone who could be a liaison between what that individual needs and the family needs, and then the um, services that are there. Okay. So 
we say, like I said, this elders are the heartbeat of our tribes, right? Of our tribal nation. So what does it mean to honor them? Um, we look at it could include respecting their knowledge, preserving cultural practices, providing care and support. All of these are essential to their, um, their mental health and wellness. And they're essential to um, our culture, our cultural practices and our cultural memory and rebuilding that, you know, so we can move toward those healing um, aspects of what we need to do both at a personal um, individual and family and community um, process okay next slide I'm trying to watch the time too um maybe it's not okay so where does the responsibility go um and this is the thing you know that um I really had to um think about is we put a lot of the responsibility on our elders to do their exercise programs, to be mobile, to be able to do all these things, et cetera, et cetera. And so we look at, in reality, their responsibility is self-advocacy, you know, which would be the family as well. But how do we, how do we become their voice if they don't know even what to ask? So we need that advocacy as well, but we need them to, you know, we need to help them strengthen their voices and what they need. And then the engagement and then the education piece on what is out there, um, what, how how could I engage? Is there is there a community program, et cetera? But we really need to look at the community and the um, tribe. And so, um, and public health and IHS, et cetera, all that's within that community or that contribute to that community or are not contributing to that community. But look at accessibility, community programs, education and outreach, support services, advocacy, again, at all different levels. So if we have programs, that are working within the community and public health, are they advocating to the next level, et cetera. Transportation, and then really infrastructure development to look at what would be safe places for elders to come to, um, both to, to live, socialize, and um, engage in, in um, healthy activities, both for physical and mental, mental health. So um, I look at community and tribal ideas, um, community, we need to look at transportation and there are grants out there that can help with transportation. Um, elders wellness centers are some ideas, cultural camps, you know, both as presenters and then uh, um, also as um, just being part of it. Uh, community gardens, intergenerational programs. How do we culturally tailor exercise programs? Do we even provide um, those types of programs um, within our communities? Interdisciplinary care teams, which often you look at um, IHS or public health, we do have on uh, several, um, I'm thinking of just tribes within the state, we do have physical therapy that is currently there. We don't have occupational therapy a lot of times, and we don't yet have like the case management that would look specific at um, the public health needs of our elders. And how do we make sure that um, someone who actually is kind of caring for that person all the way across and connecting them with what they need. And then policy advocacy, technology solutions, and then research and data collection. Um, I know there's, you know, we look at data sovereignty, but we need to really look at what is happening with our elders and what is not happening. And I think one of the most underused resources that we have in Indian country is um, community health representatives. So look at the CHRs and the IHS and then um, in public health. So, um, we look at CHRs really, I think should be looked at as the frontline public health workers, and they can play a crucial role in tribal communities. Um, if you don't know much about the program, it began in 1968, and the purpose of it was to provide services in health education, counseling, monitor client in the community, case management, emergency care, health promotion, et cetera. These are the things that I just talked about are some of the barriers to making sure that our elders are receiving the services they need and, you know, ensuring that they have the best quality of life that they can have. So we have individuals, we have a program that's in place, but I don't know that the program and the CHRs are also always being well supported as they should be. Um, and so I think that's something community by community, you know, really looking at. But they are already your culturally competent, cultural liaisons, right? And if they're the front line, they can become the stronger advocates at all different levels. And they can help you with some of that data, you know, as to what the needs are within our communities. And then how do we match those needs with resources? Um, and it does show that when you have that individual coming into the home um, where they are 
where they are stronger, where they do um, provide services, you're seeing a lowering mortality rate and hospital readmission. So I know at the end of my one of my aunt's lives, um, and I wish it probably would have happened sooner, is there was finally a CHR coming in. But at this point, my aunt was um, pretty much um, in hospice. So um, looking at these different, um, if you look up CHRs and read more about what their uh, mission, uh, vision, et cetera, are, these are the things that they are, um, that are under their, their um, program to be able to provide. Um, not that, you know, they don't need um, training um, and training programs are out there. So I really think that this is an area that um, we really need to look more at. Uh, possible funding, I just, um, you know, sometimes we always hear, well, there isn't funding. Well, there is funding. And these are just three areas quickly found. And I know that there are more. Um, I just think that um, sometimes, you know, just looking at the, the first presentation, and I know Dr. Trotter is going to talk about a significant one as well that's impacting our both our physical mental health on um, in Indian nations. And I know Dr. Ness will as well. So looking at all of the needs, um, which way do you go, right? How do you, how do you dispense those, those resources? But if we don't also put them here, we're losing that um, information that is essential for a lot of the cultural pieces that um, we thought were lost. And as each generation passes or as each age passes, we're losing even more, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's part of the problem that we've had with the language we also look at the loss of ceremonies or understanding ceremonies or different cultural aspects. So um, that that's essential. So in closing, um, I just said honoring our Indigenous elders is a profound expression of respect, recognizing their wisdom, experiences, and contributions. It involves valuing their cultural knowledge, traditions, and teachings and not losing them. So when we provide services such as this, then we keep those and we and their knowledge lives on, the traditions live on, the teachings live on, lives on as long as um we put, you know, again, our money where our mouth is basically. So um we need our youth, we need our preschoolers, we need our adults to learn, um, to have the opportunity to listen to their stories preserve cultural practices and um, provide them with culturally confident care. And a huge piece of that, again, just looking at how indigenous communities are is to really look at that intergenerational connections um, and then create safe and inclusive in spaces and then really become an advocate for their rights and helping them um, get informed so they know what their rights are as well. So by taking these actions, we not only show our respect and gratitude um, for their wisdom, but we also ensure that their contributions are valued and remembered. So I think the last, the next slide is just um, simply, well, simply a thank you.